in a church like this, with all the stuff going on, it can seem overwhelming and complicated, but it's actually very simple and it involves every single one of us. God has invited us into the opportunity to invest ourselves in the things that will matter forever. To glorify God by seeking to present every person complete in Christ. Everyone, every day, living on mission. I used this illustration years ago, so it will sound familiar to some of you. But imagine going down to the harbor, and there are two ships. One is a cruise ship, one is a battleship. Now imagine the emotions, the expectation, the attitudes of people boarding a cruise ship, and then imagine the emotions, the attitudes, the expectations of people boarding a battleship. They would be dramatically different. So now imagine that someone thinks he's boarding the cruise ship, but mistakenly boards the battleship. With all of the expectations and attitudes of, and emotions of taking a cruise, but now is on the battleship. He goes to find his room and thinks, this doesn't look like it did in the brochure. <laughs> He's trying to find the pool, the hot tub, can't figure out where the buffet is, and then is really surprised when someone starts shooting at the ship. Sadly, far too many Christians, when they heard the message of the gospel, believed that they were boarding a cruise ship. This will be the love boat. It will be a life of health, wealth, and prosperity. But as time passes, they start to realize that's not true. They get confused, they get hurt, they start to despair, and sadly, some of them walk away, believing they were deceived. The New Testament couldn't be more clear. As a matter of fact, of all the metaphors used to describe the Christian life, the overwhelming majority are military metaphors. The day you trusted Jesus as Savior, you did not board the love boat. You boarded a battleship. This is a spiritual battle, and what is at stake are the eternal souls of the people around us. Peter says we are to arm ourselves for battle. What does he mean by that? Well, that's what we want to talk about this morning. If you have a Bible, turn with us to 1 Peter chapter 4. If you're visiting with us, we're working our way through 1 Peter. Last we were in Peter, we were reminded that even if we suffer... For the sake of righteousness, we are blessed. Because we have experienced salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, no matter what happens in this life, our future is absolutely glorious and we have every reason to be encouraged. Which is what leads then to the therefore, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, in light of this, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, meaning at a point in time, God became man, human flesh, and walked on this earth. He was abused, he was slandered, he was maligned, he was reviled, and ultimately he was executed. It's the consistent language 
Peter uses Jesus suffered in the flesh, suffered during his time on earth. Since that happened to Jesus, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Therefore, arm yourselves. This is a military metaphor that means to strap on your weapon. This word is not like concealed carry where you have a weapon and maybe, possibly, someday you might need it. It's more the military metaphor of it's go time. You're headed into the battle, it's time to fight, strap it on, it's time to go to war. That's the idea of arm yourselves with the same purpose, which is basically if you're going to be a Christ follower and you understand the mission of Jesus and how Jesus was reviled and slandered and maligned and rejected, if you're going to uh, be about the mission of Jesus, you should expect the same. Arm yourselves in the sense of game face on, this is a battle. Jesus actually said that. They hated me, they'll hate you. They persecuted me, they'll persecute you. This shouldn't be uh, really uh, surprising to us. Where it says, because he who has suffered in the flesh is basically, uh, has ceased from sin, is basically saying now every Christian who identifies with the death of Jesus. It's kind of different language, but it's very consistent language in Peter. Jesus' death on the cross for sin was suffered in the flesh, and so when we trust Jesus as Savior, we identify with that. It's almost the exact wording of Paul in Romans chapter 6, that we identify that Jesus died our death on the cross. Therefore, Romans 6 says he died to sin, which means at that moment we died to the condemnation of sin, the penalty of sin, the bondage of sin. We have been set free from the shame and guilt of sin. So that's what he's referring to when he says, has ceased from sin. The grammar there matters. The text is not saying, as of that moment, you will never sin again. I wish that was true, but it's not true. We still struggle and sin. The verb tense is past tense. In the Greek, it's called a perfect tense, which means this is something that happened at a moment in time in the past, but has ramifications right up to the present. We identified with Jesus, we died to sin's condemnation and bondage, and we now have the freedom to no longer follow the sins of the flesh, but rather during this time on earth, we now can pursue the will of God. Verse three, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, meaning the pagans, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. It's very interesting language that Peter uses, but basically he's saying that we have wasted enough of our lives on things that ultimately don't matter. We've talked about in Peter, he kind of uh, cycles this information. He has certain topics and they keep cycling around and he kind of fills out the discussion. He already told us in chapter one that there were behaviors that we engaged in when we were ignorant. We were desperately looking for something to satisfy the emptiness, the longings, the desires of our souls. We didn't know where to turn. We didn't know where to find it. We were getting more desperate. We tried all these behaviors that he lists. We did that because we were ignorant. But now 
in Christ, we're not ignorant anymore. We know better. So what he's essentially saying is we've already wasted enough of our lives. Let's not waste one more day on these things. It's an interesting to, thing to think about. Honestly, what percentage of your life, at this point in your life, would you say that you actually have lived on mission for the things that matter forever? Every day that you choose to live for the things of eternity, rather than wasting our lives on the things of this world, that percentage changes. We can't change the past, but Peter says we've wasted enough of life. There's a kind of an urgency to this that uh, we'll talk about in just a second. Verse 4, in all this, they, meaning the Gentiles, the pagans, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. The excesses of dissipation, kind of a weird phrase, but it basically means in wasteful living. It's the exact same phrase that was used to describe the prodigal son when the prodigal son was just wasting his inheritance away. Who are the they? The they are the people that we used to do these things with. We used to run with. We used to waste our lives with. Kind of the old gang that we used to hang out with. Now that we've chosen the path of righteousness, the text says it surprises them. I don't really care for that translation. It isn't just that they're like surprised. It's more that they find it strange. They find it odd. As a matter of fact, there's kind of a flavor. They're actually offended by it. And as a result of that, they malign you. They laugh at you. They make fun of you. They slander you. Basically what the text is saying is when you were wasting your life away, you just looked like everyone else. Everything was fine. But once you made a decision to live for righteousness, to live for the things that matter, your righteous behavior exposes the sin of others. That's always the way it works. When you choose to walk in the light, the light exposes other people's cockroaches, and they just don't like it. As a matter of fact, they resent it. You hear stuff like, oh, now you're so holier than thou, and you don't have time for us, and you have all these ways that they kind of make fun and slander and malign because you're now choosing the path of righteousness. One of the things that's interesting to think about is Peter actually heard this directly from Jesus himself. In John chapter 3, Jesus was speaking to Peter and the other apostles when he said, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. Why? For their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Just by virtue of the fact that you now choose righteousness, it creates a light that exposes unrighteousness and the old gang doesn't like it. This is why we must arm ourselves. We must understand this is a spiritual battle. We get our game faces on. This is not going to be easy. This is not the love boat. Just simply for choosing to do the right thing, you're going to be maligned, you're going to be slandered, you're going to be treated unfairly. If you are a person that tends to be a people pleaser, you have to realize how difficult this assignment is. You cannot think by being a good Christian, everyone's going to love you. 
Just the opposite. They didn't love Jesus. They maligned him. They reviled him. They rejected him. And if you're going to follow in his steps, it is game on. you got to get your game face on and realize this isn't really going to be easy. But you also have to realize the stakes are really high. We have to take the mission very seriously. Verse 5, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There is a reminder that at the end of the day, those that attack, those that slander, those that malign will one day stand before a holy God and give an account. This isn't reason for celebration. This is reason for concern. We understand Peter has taught us that ultimately God is for the righteous and God opposes those who do evil. This is why I don't seek vengeance. This is why I'm not interested in getting even. I don't want to add to the hatred and to the anger and to the criticism of the culture. I don't expect to be treated fairly for righteousness. But I also understand at the end of the story, God will sort it out. Therefore, I can choose to follow the strategy that Peter has delivered and try to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We don't really like to talk about this as a culture, but the fact is that every person in the room, every person in the community, ultimately one day will die. And ultimately, every person will stand before a holy God and give an account. I recognize that the people of this world can have all kinds of opinions about me as a Christian. They can malign me, they can slander me, they can treat me unfairly, but at the end of the story, there's only one opinion that matters. And God sees me through the eyes of the righteousness of Jesus. On the basis of the grace and mercy of God, I have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the dead in order to obtain an inheritance that's already reserved in heaven for me. 1 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, regardless of what anybody else says, at the end of the day, that will be my judgment before God. But for those who do not know Jesus as Savior, they will stand before God, they will give an account. And apart from the salvation that Jesus offers, they will be eternally condemned. So Peter's reminding us there is a seriousness to this. This is a spiritual war, and the stakes are extremely high. He says then in verse 6, For the gospel has for this purpose been preached, even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh, meaning during this life as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Peter is saying this is why we preach the gospel. Because we understand that every person we go to school with, every person that we work with, every person in our neighborhood, every person in our community, one day will die and stand before God in judgment. So he uses as an illustration... The reason we have courageously proclaimed the gospel is because there are those who are now dead. So he's saying, as of the time of the writing of the letter, these are people that have now died. They were judged in the flesh, meaning their life in this world, by men. Most scholars think he's referring to those who were Gentiles, who were pagan. But they heard the message of the gospel and they chose to believe, to walk in righteousness. But that righteousness offended their fellow pagans. 
Therefore, they persecuted them, and most scholars think they were actually put to death for their faith. That was their judgment, the judgment of men. And yet, at that very moment in time, these people now beyond the grave are very much alive in the spirit because of the salvation they obtained through Jesus Christ. So Peter is saying this is why the gospel matters. All of us are going to face judgment, and apart from the salvation of Jesus, there is no hope. So you think now 2,000 years later, how many people have died without Christ? How many of the people you work with? How many of the people next door? How many of the people in your family or that you go to school with are going to die without Christ? Therefore, we have an assignment. We have a mission. Arm ourselves. Put on your game face. It's not going to be easy, but the stakes are incredibly high. The eternal souls of the people around us are at stake. There's a sense of urgency. Verse 7, the end of all things is near. Peter is essentially saying there's nothing that needs to happen to precede the return of Christ. Basically, the background would be, starting with Genesis 3.15, re-upped with Abraham, restated through the prophets, there was this understanding that God made a promise. The promise was that one day God himself would take on human flesh and would come to be the Messiah of the world. Christmas is the celebration that that promise was kept. There was literally a moment in time where God became flesh, was born into this world, as the God-man, he ultimately paid the penalty for sin, was buried and rose again, promise fulfilled. If you remember the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph take baby Jesus to the temple, and there they encounter Simeon. Simeon says, my eyes have finally seen your salvation. I am ready to die in peace. There was this sense of God has finally fulfilled the promise. I hear people sometimes today say, I think we're living in the last days. To which I answer, I'm absolutely sure we're living in the last days. The New Testament defines the last days as from the ascension of Christ until the return of Jesus. There's nothing else that needs to happen. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 100 years from now. But it is the imminent return of Christ. However near it was in Peter's day, it's that much closer today. One of the frustrations is we get so caught up in all these end times eschatological systems of trying to figure out exactly how it's going to happen. And usually when we do that, we miss the point. The point is Jesus is coming back and you better live ready. There's a sense of mission. This is why I can't afford to waste one more day. The stakes are high. The time is near. We need to be about the mission. There's people around us that need to hear the message of Jesus. I think one of the best ways to illustrate kind of this frame of mind is if you've ever sold a house. You get everything kind of tidied up, everything just the way you want it in order for it to sell, and then you live in this state of readiness. You're constantly making sure you don't make a mess, everything's cleaned up, everything's just right, because you never know when the realtor's gonna call, say, hey, come over in 15 minutes, I have a buyer. So you kind of live in this weird state of readiness because you never know. That's the idea. Jesus is coming back. 
Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe 100 years from now. But because of the imminent return, we need to be diligent about the assignment. We cannot waste any more days. The end of all things is near. Therefore, in light of that, be of sound judgment. Sound judgment means right thinking and sober, which means clear thinking. Game face on, right thinking, clear thinking for the purpose of prayers. Actually, plural, for the purpose of prayers is just saying that we are dialed in, aligned with the plan and purpose of God. Rather than wasting our lives, our thinking is right, our thinking is clear, and we're dialed in to the mission. Verse 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Of first priority that could be translated, that we are to be diligent, fervent in our love for one another. This is the second time that Peter has told us that the outflow of being born again is that we fervently love one another. And then this quote from the Proverbs, because love covers a multitude of sins. Basically, the idea is in order for us to be effective out there, where we are going to be slandered, we are going to be maligned, we are going to be treated unfairly, we are going to be abused. There has to be a place where we come together as family, a place that's like a place of refuge, a place where we can heal, a place where we can grow, a place where we can get strengthened, a place where we gather to get what we need in order to be effective out there where it's going to be much more difficult. Remembering that love is not an emotion. Biblically, love is a commitment of our will. That's why the text reminds us love covers a multitude of sins. Basically meaning the church is still made up of people. People are odd. People are weird. People are awkward. People can be hurtful. People can be irritating. But somehow we have to put that aside in order to unite around a common mission that is bigger than any of us. To realize the stakes are high. What we're talking about is the eternal souls of the people around us. Therefore, instead of getting petty about all these things that happen, we rise above that, we unite around a common mission, and we determine to faithfully accomplish the mission. One of the challenges of our culture is we are so selfish and self-absorbed. Everybody views the world through that grid. Therefore, we're offended about everything. People are constantly offended as a way of life. The danger is that we bring that mindset into the church. That as the people of God, we continue to be selfish and self-absorbed. That we're just offended and upset by every little thing. Which is going to basically hamper our ability to accomplish the mission. The idea is because of the seriousness of this, because of the seriousness of this mission that is greater than any of us individually, we set those things aside and we unite around a common mission in order to accomplish that mission. I think we would all agree this last year as a nation has been a very difficult year. So many natural disasters, so many human tragedies. It's just been a very, very hard year. Yet in the midst of all of that, one of the things that's been encouraging is that there have been these remarkable human interest stories that emerge out of these tragedies where people have been willing to set aside differences People have been willing to risk their lives 
in order to help or rescue people they've never met. There are some very encouraging stories that just give us a glimpse of the human spirit and remind us it is possible that we as a culture could be different than what we tend to experience day to day. It's kind of like this glimmer of hope. But I will suggest the one place where this has not been seen is in our nation's capital with our national leaders. Stop and think about this. All the way back in 9-11, within 24 hours, our nation's leaders gathered on the, states of, on the steps of the Capitol and together they sang, God bless America. Think about how much has changed just since then. Now it is less than a few hours where our nation's leaders exploit human tragedy for political agendas. Most of the time before any of the facts have actually come in. This tendency to exploit human tragedy for political gain, in my opinion, is just disgusting. But here's the deal. It is a reminder. The answer will not come from Washington. It will not. The answer will come from the people in the trenches, the grassroots, the people, everyday average people in our communities that finally say, we want something different. And certainly we, as the people of God, should be on the leading edge of that movement, not contributing to the hate and to the anger and being offended by every little thing, but roll up our sleeves, get in the mess, and be part of the solution. We as the people of God should be leading out on a new day in our community. For that really to happen, we have to be able to come together as the people of God in order to get what we need to endure what we will endure out there. So Peter goes on and kind of defines a little bit more what he means by this love. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a, a special gift, I'd prefer a calling. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So then in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's basically saying we all have a calling. We need to be diligent about our calling, whether it's up front or behind the scenes, and it's all done to the glory of God. Peter reminds us our mission statement as a church is dead on, to glorify God by seeking to present every person complete in Christ, which is exactly what Peter just said. Peter is saying there is a sense of urgency we need to arm ourselves. We need to get our game face on. We need to be thinking rightly. We need to be thinking clearly. And understand we have been set free from the condemnation and bondage of sin. Therefore, we're free to pursue righteousness. But when we do that, we will be attacked. We will be maligned. We will be slandered because our righteousness exposes the unrighteousness of the people around us, and they don't like that. But there is this sobering reminder that those people are going to stand before God in judgment. That's not something we delight in. It's something that motivates the mission. We want them to hear and understand the gospel. We want them to know what has so radically changed us. Therefore, we need to be diligent, not wasting one more day to carry out the mission. 
loving each other in here in order to be effective out there. There's probably multiple ways to illustrate this, but I'll illustrate it this way. I would say, generally speaking, as a church, we do well with this. I think we do love one another. I think we unite together. I think we have a common mission. I think we take it seriously. And I think we do a good job with that. We just need to keep at it. I also think our people take this mission seriously. Out in the community, out in the marketplace, out in the schools. I think there's many, many, many here this morning that take it seriously. They pay the price. And, and they're seeking to live their lives for the things that matter. So here's a way to think about it. Right now, today, Sunday, November 2017, as we speak, every person in the room, you know people. You know people at work. You know people in your neighborhood. You know people at your school. You know, people in the community, right now, today, they are lost. They are empty. They are desperate. They are seeking to meet legitimate needs through illegitimate means because they don't know what else to do. They wonder if there's ever going to be anything that will satisfy, that will take away this emptiness and this longing deep within them. They're wondering if there will ever be meaning and purpose to life. Some of them are wondering if there's even a good reason to live one more day. We all understand that they put on a good show at work. They put on a good show at school. They put on a good show in the neighborhood. But all alone at night, in the dark, when nobody's watching, they feel this pain intensely. And they wonder if it will ever change. Right now, they are lost and destined for judgment. But as a result of the faithfulness of many people in this room who are willing to count the cost, who are willing to live on mission, who want to be faithful stewards of the message of the gospel, some of those that are miserable today one year from today, will be sitting in these seats. They will have experienced the life-changing power of Jesus. For the first time, they will know release from their shame and guilt. They will live in the forgiveness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Their lives will be radically transformed with a sense of meaning and purpose. And no matter how hard life gets, they will have a deep sense of peace and hope and joy because they know that their future is glorious now in Christ. Those people this moment that are empty and desperate, some of them, one year from now, will be sitting here joining us in worship because they have been radically changed by the power of Jesus because of the people in this room who believe this who understand this and choose to live on mission to the praise of the glory of Jesus. Our Father, we do celebrate this morning that you have called us not to be spectators, but to be deeply engaged in this eternal mission. And what is at stake are the eternal souls of the people around us. But there's many in this room this morning who believe this and who live this and you will use them to bear eternal fruit for the kingdom. Lord, we celebrate that. Lord, we pray that each of us would live on mission to the praise of the glory of Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.